What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Super pumped to be talking about Google whistleblowing and AI censorship. We have Zach Voorhees joining us on the show. Hi, Zach. Hey, thanks, Alan. Good to be on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate all your great work that you've been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's so cool that we even had the chance to meet several years ago when we were doing our science comedy show and that we've been in touch for a while and it's great seeing what you've been doing in our world and i'm so pumped to unpack it with you for those that don't know zach's bio he was a senior software engineer at youtube google until he discovered their ai censorship weapons now he's a whistleblower fighting against censorship of you and you can find his twitter profile in the bio below Zach, we got to start things off on this point. You know, we find ourselves embedded in this reality and we're all trying to figure out what we're doing here, why we're even here in the first place, how we can maximize prosperity. And one of the things that's so close to our hearts is our ability to say what's on our mind and to be able to query the, the knowledge base of civilization and not have those things be biased with some hidden agenda or for people to not be able to have a voice. But it's also nuanced in a respect because you don't want to see murders happening on the internet and other stuff like that so how how do you see all of that kind of currently being mixed together and what we can do well i think that if in order to have a marketplace of free commerce uh, you have to have a marketplace of free ideas and when i joined google um in 2008 uh that's what google stood for was you know this we're going to have like a new form of freedom that's going to be unlocked with technology and, you know, come join us. We're going to change the world. We're going to disrupt it. It's going to be a much better world. And that's what I signed up for. And that's what I was helped doing for the eight and a half years that I was working at the company. Um, but then uh, something changed and they decided that they were going to betray all of their corporate values that they announced during their IPO, which is, uh, you know, don't be evil, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And they decided to just toss that all away in order to satisfy their political agenda. And uh, I'm realizing now that, that they're doing it as they have been able to achieve a monopoly. It's a big problem because, um, you know, being big is not really a problem. Being bad is not really a problem. But being big and being bad, that's a problem. And that's the, the place we find ourselves today. And a monopoly um, is the other thing is when there's no one else that you go to to uh, when you want to query the world's information that's been organized and that you have these main principles. This is such a nuanced point. It's so difficult to get to some of the most important roots of this because we use um, so many of the incredible um, technologies that are being brought forth uh, by Google. We all use the Maps feature. We A lot of us use the Mail feature. Um, a lot of us use um, Android technology, the web browser. Um, a lot of us, again, query the, 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 data, the knowledge base of society. But the question is, what's happening when we do that? What's going on in the background when we do that? And how can we build a trusting relationship between between an organization that claims to organize the world's knowledge and the way that I query it and my relationship with that. Well, it's, it's really easy. You know, you just let the algorithm uh, figure it out, right? Like the way that Google was able to rise up as the number one search company is that they figured out that the importance of a website was determined by how many um, things were able to link back to it. So, for example, you know, we, and we already have this intuitively uh, for scholarly papers, right? How do you know whether a paper is a really high quality piece of science? Uh, well, a good signal for that is how many people are citing it. So if I see a paper and it's got like, you know, 200 other papers that, you know, cite it as a basis of its research, 
for their research, then I think to myself, okay, well, this is an authoritative piece. This is obviously very useful for the progression of science. You know, if I see a paper that has zero, like, citation links to it, then I know that nobody gives a crap about it. It hasn't really done a lot to further science because no one's using it as a foundation to, um, you know, advance science. Well, Google took, you know, essentially the way that science works and then applied it to the internet and said, let's figure out, you know, how important something is based upon how many people link to it. And you know what? That was a winning formula that worked really well. And Google became a really big company because of all of their searching that people were able to do and find inf the information that they were looking for. And, uh, and now that they're applying um, the censorship, uh, it looks like you know, they're, they're trying to make things more complex. They're adding a lot of stuff uh, to their engine in order to bias these, these results. Um, let me give you an example of, yeah. of what that looks like. Let's do it. So um, Google has an army of human rankers that go through and figure out the authoritativeness of a website. They call it the EAT score. Stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness of a website. Wow. Every single website has an EAT score? Uh, I don't know if every single website has an EAT score. But, but popular I, ones. But, the, but I, th I think the results that appear on the front page have an EAT score. Interesting. So what they do is, you know, they go and they say, well, you know, is this site authoritative? Well, what they've, what they've done with how they rank uh, authoritativeness of a website is that they say, what does Wikipedia have to say about this website? Okay, you know, if Wikipedia says, oh, this website like has all these like accolades and has all these glowing things that people have said, they've won all these awards, then Google's going to be like, the, a rater working for Google is going to manually add a high score for that website. Mm. Now, if a website has a bunch of slander uh, attached to it, oh, this person's a conspiracy theorist or whatever, well, then that website's going to get like a really low score. Mm. So they're literally using the opinion of what Wikipedia has to say about something in order to bias their results. And the question is, well, you know, how, how authentic is, is Wikipedia? How much does it accurately reflect the consensus of the Internet? And one of the things that um, a lot of people have noted, including myself, is that Wikipedia is being vandalized. They're closing the gates so that people that uh, 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 can't get access to edit a Wikipedia article, uh, even if, they're, if the Wikipedia article is about themselves, they can't even like, correct the record. And for some reason, you've got all these um, social justice warriors that seem to have a predominant amount of access to Wikipedia. And they're, they're, they're getting rid of ev everyone that has like, a conservative bent. Um, and as a result, like the entire internet's being re-skewed based upon you know what Wikipedia is doing. So they've, they've gone from an algorithmic company to a um, let's like rate everything according to what Wikipedia says about it, which means that Wikipedia is now a really highly politicized um, uh, ranking system for the entire internet. And mm -hmm. uh, you know who asked for this? Right? Like nobody asked for this. Everyone loved the Google algorithm. They thought it was really good. We were able to find the information. Now, as a lot of people noted, you can't find a lot of the things when you do a search anymore. And the reason why you can't do these things when you're doing a search anymore is because Google is deciding that its EAT score, its expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness is low. So it's, it's like pushing it to like, you know, the second or the third or the four, you know, 15th page uh, on the search engine. And so it disappears. Due to specific keywords being used, like if someone labels you a conspiracy theorist or if someone is trying to make you seem like what your, uh, your trustworthiness is low, then you get, you get downranked to the point where your EAT score shows up on, you only show up on the second page, which, what is it, like such a small, small percentage of people go to the second page. Right. Of, Everyone's trying to go for the first five links. Right, that's that's the top spot. 
So, um, so yeah. then it, it, so this is such a big challenge that even comes up in the first place is this idea that, okay, can we over, it's been just 20 years really of trying to aggregate the world's information and try and put it somewhere that's, that's, you can query it. This is a very tough thing to do, but then how do you actually make it so that it's, that it does, uh, the, that does the most optimal job possible and it brings the most good to the world and it doesn't a- allow evil to, to happen. Well, I think that the system that they had before was working really well to do that. There was really no complaints. People were like, wow, Google's amazing. And now it's like, wow, I'm getting better results off the alternative search engines uh, in, you know, to find information. So, what, you know, And this is like DuckDuckGo is one of them. Yeah, DuckDuckGo, Startpile, uh, no, Startpage, Dogpile. Um, Bing and Yahoo are actually now better in a lot of ways than Google is. Interesting. Um, I want to ask then, um, this is this is one way that we are uh, also um, querying information. There's another one. Um, there's all the other social platforms that we use to query information. Um, there's... Uh, there's the there's there's different uh combinatorics that are happening across the world you have the united states which has a different relationship between its government and its corporations than does china for example when you have uh their government and the way they interplay with baidu which is like their main search engine so okay well what would it look like you know what does that you know what are all these different like permutations that are kind of rising in different countries and different browsers and the way that um, people are using to to try and query knowledge is it possible that then there is a a most optimal solution that's kind of going to grow out of this it's obviously really important to, to figure this out because when you have people that are trying to use um, the internet to communicate things out into the world and then if the decision is made by any of these different uh, megaphones to decide to eliminate your ability to say something, um, it can take away from the possibility and then you throw money and the involvement of power um, and those dynamics into the equation. This is very important to get right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, China has, you know, um, the state is more powerful than the corporations. um, And as a result, they have censorship in everything. I mean, they've got the Great Wall of China, the Great Firewall. Firewall of China. Yeah. And as a result, you can't get information into the country. Um, you know, if you want to look at a YouTube video in China, uh, just not going to work. You I have mean, to I use can, a VPN. You have to use yeah. a VPN, and they've been cracking down the VPNs, um, and it's getting harder and harder and harder in order to get through that firewall. Um, it's really becoming like an impenetrable barrier. Um, and so, um, you know, that's not going to work very well. I mean, it, 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 it's weird. In a Chinese-style system, you can still find good information as long as it has nothing to do with politics, right? Like if you want to learn how injection molding works, um, they're not going to censor that information because it's not politically sensitive. Mm. But if you want to have like the freedom of, of ideas, um, you're not going to be able to find the truth. And the thing is, is that everyone in China knows that that's the way that it's going. It's kind of like Russia and the Soviet Union. Everyone knew that the government was lying. Um, and that's sort of the way it is in China right now. This is again. This is how how does this how do we do this optimally? You don't want to see a slip up by one of these platforms where all of a sudden I'm seeing a recommendation of a beheading video on my feed. Um, so there, there's do you like free speech is crucial, but also don't up like how do they prevent the uploading of rape or prevent the uploading of of violence or, or underage yeah, pornography underage right? porn How, yeah. so what do you think about about that yeah so the thing is is that there's a lot of people right now that are saying oh we need like a blockchain solution so that we can like not get stuff taken down i'm like yeah as soon as you have that someone's going to open up cp is going to like upload some uh underage porn and um then the whole society is going to be like we have to reconfigure ourselves so we can like get rid of it so the whole thing that you can have like an immutable database that once you post something, it stays there and no one can take it down. Yeah, that's just not going to happen. Um, you need to have a system in which you can remove content that is obscene and offensive 
Um, you know, and I don't mean like, oh, like I'm triggered offensive. I mean like, no, no, this is like really offensive. Um, you know, not an expression of idea, just like, you know, underage pornography. Like, how do you get rid of that? Let's just use that as a, as an example. Yeah. I believe that you should be able to have a community uh, moderation tool. So enough people report something as, you know, I find this obscene, um, and then it gets uh, flagged for uh, review, and then someone says, yeah, this is definitely not cool, and then they remove it, right? Like, I don't think that that, you know, I mean, it could even be that is that the people say, no, this is obscene, and then, like, a machine learning algorithm can go through and... Uh, look at that and say, yep, this looks like, you know, pornography. So, sorry, gets, you know, eliminated. And then the person that uploaded it gets a chance to appeal. Um, and then if they appeal, then there's like a human judge that comes in and mm. says, you know, did the, did the algorithm, did the machine learning algorithm uh, make the right choice? Um, I think that's the best way. You have to drive it to democracy. The, the problem with these tech companies is that they're so obsessed with control, they want to centralize everything, Right. Uh, YouTube is like, oh, we want to be the arbitrators of what's uh, socially acceptable or not. And really what should happen is that it should be decentralized, like push the control of reporting the video as obscene to the edges as far as possible. Mm. You know, you're still going to have the problem of like, you know, mobs coming on and saying, oh, we don't like this content because it actually doesn't say something that we like, you know, and uh, and then, you, you know, you have to have a fail safe for that. You need to be able to prevent political speech from being wrongly removed because, you know, of mob attacks, right? And there's a solution for all this. You just got to push it up to the edge and decentralize it, but have a, a central arbitrator at the end of the day, um, you know, making a decision on that. And I think that's scalable. I think that really works, but we're really not seeing that right now. We're basically, you know, um, like we centralize it out to the communities. Let, yeah. the, let the communities themselves flag for obscene uh, content like underage child pornography interesting and then have that um and then the question is you know can it be flagged fast enough how many eyeballs you know does it get to before it gets flagged? you know and, and the thing is is that we're going to have a lot of like machine learning algorithms that are like ai is getting really good right so you know at some point you can have an ai that like is a specialist in this sort of things and then it says classifies it and says oh hey wow this might be, you know, let's flag it for human review. Like it just automatically flags it for human view. It doesn't even go up for a community to review because they can tell that there's um, a, a problem like something like that in it. And then there's also the this, this strike policy as well. The, what do you, how do you feel about these account, like in terms of the account and having an account that's, uh, that is linked and authenticated to an actual human being? Uh, and that way, yeah, so instead of anonymous, um, that way if, if you are posting content that is uh, obscene or that is uh, a, a violent and then you get a couple strikes, then you're yeah, not, so how, how do we do that? There's, so this, this concept of, anonymity and um you know being something created by human are usually entrained with each other like they're, they're kind of like mashed together as one subject and they're actually like two different subjects right because um you know the one thing is you want to make sure that you you don't want to have these bots going and generating content and then posting it um because the thing is, is that with uh, with AI is getting a lot better. Those bot wars are insane when you look yeah. at those videos and pictures of those little cell phone farms oh. and how there's just a ton of different cell phones with fake accounts following, fake accounts posting. Yeah, yeah. the click farms are out of control, right? And what they're doing is that they're mobbing peop like videos and they're like downvoting it um, or they're upvoting it and you know, it becomes very clear to like what's going on when you see a video and you look at the graph of its likes, dislikes, and then you see like 6,000 dislikes come within 30 minutes. I've seen that before, right? Um, and they'll, they'll do that to like try to like manipulate the algorithms. And um, tech companies could solve this, but they don't because they want the manipulation because the oligarchs that run the world enjoy being able to manipulate the conversation and we, we'll get into this in more depth in a little bit yeah. this global ruling but you can always tell you can always tell when something's being manipulated um because 
I'll, I'll give you an example. You go to Twitter and you see someone that has like, you know, um, a million followers, okay? And then they post like a tweet and they'll have like 30 likes, okay? I have almost 27 thousand followers on Twitter, which isn't that much. I mean, it's a lot more than I used to have, but it's not that much. But yet I'll get 200 likes when I do a posting. Why? Because I have real people that follow me and um, people like Rosie O'Donnell, uh, to use an example, she doesn't get any engagement. Why? Because her followers are fake. And it's the same thing with all these media outlets. They're, they're purchasing uh, users that will like follow them so that they, they have a higher prestige and the, the algorithms are pushing them up. And Th those fake account farms that we were talking about. Yeah. That's when you buy, you get those fake account farms to follow you. Yeah. So my friend, and, yes, I, my friend Patrick Ryan uh, helped we, we Milo. Had, we had Pat Ryan, yeah, on the, on the show. You, you have? Yeah, we had Pat Ryan. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's we liked, interesting. We liked him a lot. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. So we talked a lot about the point of creation and what's actually happening here, what, how the manipulations are happening. We right. went, yeah, we went really deep into that. So as you may know, the episode's a, a Gnostic warfare for those that yeah. are interested. Yeah, on our channel. Yeah, yeah he's continue. really into the Gnostic warfare. <laughs> this whole thing he's developed. When did you when you interview him? By the way, uh, maybe like nine ish months ago. Okay, that might be right. That was before I knew yeah. him. Yeah. Uh, so he bought twenty thousand followers for Milo Yiannopoulos and was able to like push him up. And Milo got so popular that Steve Bannon decided to back him. So you know how much 20,000 followers cost? $50. Yeah. Now keep in mind, this was like 2016, I believe. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of people didn't know like this even existed, um, especially a lot of the older people didn't know. But you know, I know personally like this tactic being used in order to boost like signals. And now that the secret's out of the bag, everyone's doing it. But you know, um, none of the followers are real. Uh, they're created, you know, ephemerally uh, by you know a, a, a swarm of people or by a bot. And then they go and they follow somebody, and then that's it. And then they and then the bots and then they get too cheap to keep on paying for all the likes and retweets. So the botnets um, just sort of just goes like cold they they kind of like that don't do it they just kind of sit there and they don't do anything um and this is uh this is the way that a lot of our online discourse is is manipulated by twitter uh on reddit it's even it's even worse there they've got an active system of suppression and they've got people that come in and uh post in the comment section and the reason why is because reddit started to form a very large uh, rebellious nature against the, the tech oligarchs uh, because of the way that they're able to comment. It was amazing. I was like, oh my God, Reddit's amazing. Like they, they critique all the mainstream media stories and show that it's bullshit. Well, now you go on there and it seems that all of Reddit is now controlled in uh, the political, the world news, the news itself. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. Like all these fake users out there, shills, whatever, we can't verify their identity. The tech companies don't want to have something in there that you know verifies it. China has figured this out because what they do is they tie it to your phone number. Mm. So it's like, well, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna make a bot, then you're gonna have to pay the cell phone bill to have that number, mm. and that that gets rid of 99% of the problems mm. because people want to do it where they're paying a, a penny per user. Um, Fifteen dollars per user just makes the whole like issue super expensive. They're not going to do it. Mm, interesting. What an interesting solution. And that's kind of what we were talking about, where it's a bunch of different combinatorics works that are happening in different countries, but it's also the actual software platforms themselves. Like we were giving these examples of different search engines that can be used, or different social platforms that can be used. And then the idea is that can you then let these forces go and sort of compete for humans to for humans to figure out which which of these forces are the most decentralized enable the most free speech have the best policies for taking down content that's violent or child pornography um, or rape etc 
and then which ones um, do you hold most dearly to their to that pillar of their ethos, which says that they want to um, help be a positive catalyst for conscious evolution um, on the planet. And I look forward to figuring out what one is that going to be and how do we help participate in that? Well, right now there's a lot of anger because what happens is that for these alternative social media platforms that try to do that, they get banned, okay? So gab.com is a really good example. Uh, they launched, um, there was this uh, uh, operation where I think the deep state went in and started like posting Hitler stuff. And then the media is like, oh my God, Gab is filled with Hitler stuff. So we gotta ban it now, so. Um, wow, so this these types of operations can just take down um, the the incumbency of a ruling elite could um, have these operations. Yeah, they just every time you get something that challenges the elite, um, the, the 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 social media networks owned by the oligarchs, they just play the the Holocaust card or the Hitler card, and uh, and then as a result, Gab got taken off of the App Store. Um, they had an app for iPhone and they had an app for Android and now they are both removed. Now they're just web-based? Now they're web-based. Yeah, there's no native app. So you have to like log in through a web app to, in order to use them. Wow. wow. And this is the problem. So the thing is, is that the community on Gab has a chip on their shoulder. Mm, yeah, because all that media came saying that, oh, they let this happen. Yeah. The, the, in a sense, that would be like saying that a, a Twitter or a YouTube or whatever had some video on it, and oh my gosh, all these hit pieces. You have to, you can't, you you have to st remove the YouTube or Twitter apps from the app stores. That's, yeah, that's yeah. right. And they're they're claiming to be platforms under Section Two Thirty, where they say, hey, we get like liability from being sued because we're platforms. So you can't hold us like, you know, uh, responsible for the content. Mm. And mm. then they shredded that immunity by acting as a publisher because they started censoring, not because of things were objectionable, but because uh, they were aligned with a political agenda or not. Yeah. So then maybe a, a solution of sorts would be that then... Uh, if you wanted to remain completely, uh, in a sense, uh, agnostic to the content uh, and you yourself, so there's a no political agenda, you're not allowed to have any political agenda, but rather it you act as just a medium for free speech communication. And then what you do from there is you create that decentralized uh, um, ability to flag uh, content and have the machine learning algorithms that are also working on it. But again, how do you like how do you have algorithms that are, you know, yeah, biased towards finding things that are violent or rape or child pornography got that. But then then this is always, you know, how do you have that fairness in that approach? How do you have, how do you prevent a bot farm from coming on and flagging your piece of content? Because, because it may have a, an agenda that's different than this is such an interesting, um, well, yeah, piece like, for me. I mean, the thing is, like I said, like, you know, if you have a phone number tied to uh, a user, then you can't create a bot farm to come in. Um, I think that's, that's the best solution for that. Um, you know, and the thing is, is that people are snitches. Like this happens all over society. You know, Soviet Union is like, oh, this person's doing something wrong. You know, and that's just like someone's like violating housing codes. Like for something that's like violent or like obscene, you're gonna have people that, you know, their biggest joy in the life is hitting that report button and removing content off the platform because. Uh, they know that it's objectionable. So, you know, there's just these trigger happy people that will just hit the report button whenever they get a chance to, you know, see something that's that's objectionable. Yeah. Okay, let's venture into um, the deep state and the global ruling elite. Yeah, what's going on? I mean, it's a big, in many ways, it feels like it's a big game of like, risk and monopoly and sims that we're all experiencing together and that there is some sort of powers that are being channeled through that are purposely 
in creation to make it more, uh, uh, to rise more to the challenge. Uh, you're put into a utopia, there's no challenge to rise to. Um, but here we have this big challenge of conscious evolution to rise to. But what are these forces that are channeling through people? And then how is that being acted upon our world? You gave that example with Gab. Yeah, yeah. You so, you know, the, the oligarchs that rule the world have a script and that script is based on control of the people i think like the etymology of the word government actually means like mind control or something like that um and the thing is is that people don't change their behavior to positive stimuli um i mean drugs food sex like these core things they will do that but if your life is really easy like you know Rich kids that have everything that they want, they don't tend to make, you know, very ferocious entrepreneurs, right? Because life has been easy. It's the people that had a hard life that, you know, become like modify their behavior so that they become like a type A workaholic. Mm -hmm. um, people respond to trauma. Mm -hmm. And the way that the ruling el elites know how to run society is by traumatizing people so that they change their, their behavior. And so um, the only way that you can traumatize someone is you know, either by physical pain, either by emotional pain. And for those two the types, you, know, you can inflict emotional pain by saying, oh, we're going to like, we're gonna give you some scarcity. Like, you know, you're, 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 you're a victim. Um, and you don't, you know, the reason why you don't have what you want in life is because you've been victimized by this other class of people. And so if they can pump that into people's heads, you know, whether it's based on your skin color, based upon your sex or uh, your chosen identity, um, if, if you feel oppressed, then you will feel traumatized. And if you're traumatized, then you're controllable. And so all mind control is based on trauma. It's, it's, it's not even like something that's like conscious. It's like the, the lizard brain part of who we are. Um, won't actually modify the behavior unless we're traumatized in some way. And so all the things that you see, like all the methods of mind control, whenever there's a church being built, the first thing they want to do is they want to be like, okay, well, you should feel bad about the things that you do. With the, with the, with the you know, Catholic church, it was like, you know, original sin, you're in debt to God. And they want to make you feel like you're in debt. Like debt isn't just about money. It's like a fundamental aspect of human behavior. So you're in debt you're sinful, you're a bad person, um, and as a result of that, you need to do X, Y, and Z in order, in order to redeem yourself. This template has been recycled over and over and over by these social engineers, right? White privilege. You should feel bad about being white because you've made everyone else really poor and put them in poverty, and because of your prosperity, everyone else is doing bad. Oh, and by the way, every time you drive your car, you're wrecking the planet. Every single thing where you're like, God, I feel so bad about this. Oh, man. And the only way to like redeem yourself is through activism. Oh, I got to like raise awareness and like show every people like that this thing is bad and they need to like change their behavior. Kind of the same way I'm doing, right? Um, and that redemption like sort of quality, like that's the through the through the redemption process is the way that we're controlled in order to enact change um and we you know we fight amongst each other we want to overthrow the government um all these different things that we do contribute towards moving our society to one that is controlled by a ruling oligarchy you know now we've got like this fake democracy um that is uh, like that's in the western world and throughout a lot of the different world you know monarchies tend to be a little bit more stable but the most stable state that was ever created was in egypt mm -hmm. um and that form of government is what i call a cult state and the cult state lasted for five thousand years it's my belief that the ruling oligarchs of the world are trying to get us back into a cult state where the leader is aligned with God and everybody worships them. And if you don't, then you get brutally punished. Uh, in Egypt, if you didn't, you know, like the pharaohs, you try to rebel against them. 
um, they would shut off your water and then everyone's dead in three, in three days because it's a freaking desert, right? That's the kind of world that the ruling elite wants to recreate. And the only way that they can convince us to give up our democracy and overthrow the Constitution is they got to make things really bad. They got to traumatize us a lot. And then the solution, the atonement, is overthrowing the government and putting the globalists in charge of running things. And then when we find out, oh, it's actually like a state of feudalism, and oh, by the way, it's going to be the, the, the leader's going to be this cult figure, like, you know, say Obama, for example, he, was, there was, he had like a cult following. Oh, he can, you know, like the media worshiped him. Right? This is the kind of template that they're going for. Um, and that's the way that the, that the oligarchs uh, want to run society. And it's up to us as individuals to say, no, 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 you, you oligarchs are the source of the problems. Right? You create the wars, you create the shortages. And the thing is, is that what we have to realize is that the, the scarcity of health, the scarcity of energy, uh, the scarcity of, uh, of, 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 of you know, uh, being able to get ahead, and prosperity, these are all artificially created. Because the thing is, is that if we realized our full potential as human beings, yeah. then the thing is, is that we're not going to live in a world of trauma. Well, guess what? We can't be controlled in a state of abundance because we just, it's just like people are going to be like, hey, let's all collectivize under a one world totalitarian socialist government. People are like, no, my life's really good. Why would I want to do that? Um, and as a result, like we won't, we won't collectivize. We'll only collectivize if things are so bad that collectivizing to overthrow the government actually creates a better living situation. Oof. Yeah, big, 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 yeah, big drop, drop there. Right? I like that. Um, all right, so let's let's um, start with this principle that you listed, which is that uh, trauma is what makes us controllable. Mm -hmm. I like that principle a lot. So trauma is coming from all different types of angles. Um, trauma comes from an ancestral lineage sometimes. Trauma comes from birth sometimes and stimuli that w happened to us then. It's trauma comes from the way that you're immediately told when you enter into the world that you are separate. You are not an interconnected uh, being. You are separate. Uh, and so that also makes it uh, may distance us further from unity consciousness and actually uh, more towards this uh, separation where I need mine. Um, and then you have media that comes in, then you have government that comes in, you have the banking system that comes in, you have the healthcare system, big pharma, big tech, you have all these different pressures that then start cooking at you and creating these feedback loops of habit when I don't even know sometimes if I'm actually in control. That's the big question we feel that when we use these devices how often is it that you are, are all of a sudden noticing that you've been on that platform for an hour and you only went on to check for a couple minutes how God, it's so bad isn't that like i'm just going to check a message and then like uh, two hours later it's just like you wake up and you're like oh my god i've been on this phone and now the sun's setting happens all the time right yeah so then the, the a question is what's actually going on between the relationship between that that uh, that technology and how we're and who we are and how we're using it and then what the like what is actually going on with my deep like you you indicated this deep reptilian brain of ours that is then traumatized in ways and then that is a, a, a constant selling of fear across platforms not selling abundance not selling interconnectedness not selling um our ability to uh to transcend the the issues and grow and heal from the issues that we've experienced but pinning people up against each other and saying that that you are the enemy and I am all good and I have no bad and that by doing that then that makes it easier for us to be controlled through these further memes that are propagated that make it easier for us to control be controlled so then is it then that it's a uh a, a deeper shift from within, from inner engineering that happens w within each of us so that we kind of gain the, the ability to see the truth behind what's actually happening. And then that's the awakening. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, let's, let's talk about like social media addiction first. I'll, I'll answer your question, right? So like, with, like, I think that 
a lot of people are like, oh, like all this like addictive stuff that's happening with like social media um, is uh, uh, fundamentally attributed to um, novelty. Okay, like we had this like world that we grew up in. Uh, I grew up in the MTV era, right? And uh, we thought, and there was it was basically like an Overton window of like acceptable discourse. Mm -hmm. And you thought this way, and and, and extended from the left into the right, and um, and uh, and there was a lot of things that you were acceptable to believe in. But you know, you, but like for example, certain things were out of the Overton window. Like you couldn't like you know. Say you wanted to own celebrate Hitler, for yeah, example, yeah. right? Like that was unacceptable. Yeah, I okay. want to own people again, stuff like that. Sure. Or like what yeah. white nationalism really meant, right? Like, oh, you, you, if you're a white nationalist, it means you want to gas the Jews, okay? And now what you're finding out is, um, people are like, look, your language has been manipulated. Nationalism doesn't mean like excluding other people; it means the peopling, the collective identity of an ethnicity coming together. Oh, and by the way, like there's a lot of like genocide happening across the world. Like I got a roommate that came from South uh, Africa. Uh, she fled because of the genocide that's happening over there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is that we're getting a lot of novelty that's exploding right now in the social media space. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's happening is that we're awakening to a whole bunch of lies and deceit. And I'm addicted to it. Like I grew up thinking all these different things. Um, I was like a big environmentalist. I, I still am an environmentalist, but you know, back in 1998, I was like, oh, global warming and the ozone layer hole and all this other stuff. Um, and then, and, but I didn't get any exposure to the opposite side. Like I thought I did, but it turns out that they were just controlled opposition. Well, now fast forward to like the last three years. And um, I now realized that the ozone hole, hole was a scam. Uh, and you know, a lot of people won't think that that's fine. They could, should be skeptical, but you know, I've looked at the evidence a lot and I discovered that, and I read in the math and I was like, Oh, the ozone layer in the hole, like, was it something that was real? Uh, I mean, it was real. It just wasn't caused by, um, chlorophyll carbons. Um, and then, um, it was actually caused by the fact that when the earth tilts, um, ozone is created when the sun hits the thermosphere and it like creates an ozone like thing. And then what happened is that uh, if you don't get a sunshine, you don't get a ozone it happens in the North and the South. Just doesn't, doesn't mean that the earth is like ripping open and like we're getting flooded with all this radiation. Um, then with uh, global warming, I thought that was like totally happening. And then I got real information and I was just like, Oh wow, that's just, a scheme and a hoax to make us pay a carbon tax and to make us feel guilty, like it's trauma-based programming. And so um, as a result, I like come on this new realization. I'm like, wow, this is, this is like, uh, oh yeah, I, I found out what the real cause of global warming is. It's causing from the sun. And when the sun heats up, it starts, you can tell when the sun heats up because it gets these, um, the, 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 these bubbles that form in the sun of, of hot gases. And when they hit the surface, they explode and they jet out. And then the magnetosphere like pulls it back in. And when you get all these eruptions, what happens is that you get a burst of uh, hydrogen particles that like get thrown out of the, of the surface of the sun. It streams out as these giant blasts of solar wind. And when they hit the thermosphere of the upper atmosphere, uh, it causes all that, like all those particles going at almost relative speed, hit the, the top of the atmosphere, they heat it up. The atmosphere actually grows in the thermosphere. And then that heat radiates down. It's just why the graph is like all crazy like this is because it's following the motion of the solar cycle. Now we're like, now the solar, um, the sun, is calmed down. We don't have like almost any sunspots. And as a result of this, uh, the farmers at Almanac and NASA in 2017 were like, oh yeah, we're, we're about to have like a lot of cold weather. And then what happened this year? We had crop failures all over the Midwest. What happens is that the thermosphere collapsed because of the lack of solar wind that was coming out. As a result, um, the, all the, the carrying capacity of the atmosphere went down and the, uh, and the, the water that was in there got squeezed out like a sponge. We had all this record like 
uh, rain that like hit the, the Midwest. And it, we had massive crop failures all over the world, which is exactly what the Farmer's Almanac was predicting, right? Um, and so I'm sitting here and I, and I realize the truth and about what's happening. And I see that there's been a sophisticated censorship regime against these really like um, experts in climatology. They're like, oh yeah, it's just a scam, right? And here's like the, the graph. And then like you find out that the hockey stick graph that Al Gore was pushing in his movie um, Inconvenient Truth, that the guy behind that is has been an eight-year lawsuit because his graph was completely based off of junk data that he won't even release. He has never released it since... And he actually got sued in order to release it, and he still hasn't released it. And it's and you can go look it up. Uh, Michael Mann is the guy, and and um, there are certain things that are totally totally that are happening though about the parts per million of CO two in our atmosphere and the, the CO two is not a is not a contributing factor. It's not a significant contributing factor to global warming. And also the uh, acidification of our oceans. Uh, there's are we have issues with the amount of uh, phytoplankton that are that are the ones that are contributing to uh, the oxygenation of our planet and our trees that are contributing yeah, yeah. to oxygenation. So, so these are important. It's just called the Anthropocene for a reason. I mean, humans are being are have absolutely become this single uh, most right. Uh, contributing. If we want to get rid of it, on the he, so there was a yeah. guy by the name of John Mayer. Uh, he was an oceanographer, and in 1980, he went to the. Um, climatology some climatology summit and he said i've discovered that the phytoplankton in the oceans are not bottlenecked on the amount of co2 they're bottlenecked on the amount of available iron and he's like i've discovered a process where if you just sprinkle iron into the ocean it will create a phytoplankton bloom and this is the reason why there's a phytoplankton bloom that happens after a volcano explodes oh, and by the way if you increase the phytoplankton you increase the zooplankton you're going to increase the sardines you're going to increase and then everything else feeds off of that and you get this huge food bloom like this life bloom that happens um by feeding from, them iron by 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 seeding the water with iron Guy died of mysterious causes, and um, there was a uh, there was a revival of his research uh, in the early 2000s. And then the UN got together, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we're now banning iron ocean fertilization in all waters internationally." Boom! Right? Hmm. Nobody ever talks about this stuff, right? The Green New Deal, in fact, says we got to get rid of nuclear, you know, and no iron ocean fertilization is being discussed. They won't even have it part of the conversation. Like Fox News, you'll go on there and they'll be like, oh, we've got like a climate skeptic. They'll never ever talk about iron ocean fertilization. Well, we also have to do longitudinal testing to understand what actually happens after 50 or 100 years. And simulation technology helps us That's, do stuff. We've already that. done this because whenever a volcano explodes, it dumps tons of iron into the ocean. And in fact, uh, a researcher. But do we know every single micro aspect that happens to that ecosystem after a volcanic eruption? This is these are just really right, right. They're tough questions. They're tough questions, but we can't study that because the UN has banned all study in international waters, so we can't do any study at scale. But according to the climate alarmist, anthropomorphic CO two is such a systemic threat that we're going to end the planet in ten years. Um, and they're getting so desperate that they're now openly talking about dusting aluminum aerosols by plane into the atmosphere in order to reflect the light back out of the earth. Okay? It's like, no, 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 no. You don't need to dump aluminum into the air. You just put some effing um, iron into the oceans, and we already know what that, what that does because of all the volcanoes that have exploded in the past. And... The fact that this is so, you know, I, I understand your point. Like, we don't sure. know what's going to happen. And I, my, my response to that is well, we kind of do um, at scale. And the thing is, is that we can always like study it. Like, you know, of do course, a study. We need to study all of the different exactly. possibilities for ameliorating what we're doing uh, on uh, as, as the main contributors to the change that's happening on our planet. We, we, and this is why social media is so addicting, right? Because it's just like, oh, I've got this idea. And is this idea going to be able to get in? And so right now I'm playing a game. I'm like trying to figure out like, how can I get this information in there and propagate it out so that we actually have the full collection 
of ideas in the marketplace. Instead of having ones that censor out um, ideas that are rising that maybe figures want to prevent those specific ideas from rising because they have money stakes in the archaic codes. That like exist. the IPCC is going to be the one that benefits from a global warming treaty and a carb where we have carbon credits. Like it's not like the IPCC is some objective, non-biased organization. The IPCC is the is the Coke version on the left. Like Coke, the Coke brothers were like, oh, we're gonna like do anti-climate science, you know, or anti-global warming science because we benefit from all the our oil investments. The IPCC is the exact same way. If they do climate alarmism, then they're the ones that are gonna make the trillions of dollars when we put in this carbon credit system. And that's like it's like wow. Versus having the entire planet be more focused on having scientists and engineers and the right amount of um, financing to back it up to do things like free energy systems. Yeah, and that's yeah. the thing. It's like once you point out to people, it's like, well, we can reduce the CO2 load in the, in the ocean. We can reduce the CO2 load in the air. We can, in fact, why are we even using fossil fuels? Like fossil fuels is a 19th century energy source. Like we've got freaking nuclear Right, and we don't have like the old nuclear that was like using uranium two thirty five. We've got, we've got the Tokamaks technology. Re reactors. No, no, that's fusion. Fusion is fusion. Hot fusion is a scam, kind of. The tokamak is a scam. I kind of like the, from what I understand about uh, about hot fusion, it's what happens in the sun, and that we ourselves can replicate that exact process on our planet and be really set for. So let me tell you about the benefit of of thorium nuclear, and I think you might come to a different appreciation. Thorium nuclear burns 99% of the thorium um, in, its, in its cycle, where right now uranium-235 burns about like 1%, all right? What you can do, because, the, because it's so good at burning all the available fuel, you can take the plutonium, you can take our nuclear waste, you can add it, and then it, because there's all these neutrons flying around, it will get deactivated, and it will, it will break down, and what we can do is we can actually instead of generating waste, it actually generates negative waste because we can take all the waste that we have right now and we can use it as feedstock for these thorium reactors. We can solve all of the nuclear waste problem in the world with thorium nuclear energy. And Interesting. And the, and the thing is, well, how do we know that it works? Well, we know that it works because the Oak Ridge National Laboratory built one in 1967, put it on a plane and had the plane fly around the world, okay? It's a very, very, very safe nuclear technology that was abandoned. Why? Because it doesn't produce weapons-grade plutonium. That's it. We so it's called thorium. Thorium li uh, liquid lifter. So lifter is thorium lifter. The, no, yeah, thorium lifter. So the the lifter stands for liquid thorium fluoride reactor. Liquid thorium fluoride reactor. And what it does okay. is it mixes thorium into a salt and then the salts flow around in this, in this thing and cause a reaction. Um, and it doesn't have the ability to melt down because if you start having a, uh, a, 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 an out of bounds event where they, we have a runaway reaction, then what happens is that um, there's a mechanism. There's like a, the salt will, f there's like a, there's like a tube to a drain tank and with, if the tube is unobstructed, all of the liquid would flow out. But they've got a fan running on the tube. And so what happens is that it forms a plug of solid salt. And as long as that fan's going, then the thing will stay hard. Well, if the power shuts down and the fan start, stops running, the plug will melt and everything will drain out. Or if the runaway reaction gets too hot, then it doesn't matter if there's a fan, the reaction gets so hot, it'll also melt the thing and then everything flows out into a drain tank. That drain tank has a like, I don't know, like carbon in it and that carbon will absorb the uh, neutrons and cause the reaction to go subcritical and then the thing cools off. So there's lots of different potentials for free energy and there's potentially some sort of forces that are at play that are preventing our ability to identify what these free energy sources are and to distribute them, democratize them around the world to enable us to maximize our prosperity. And th that these 
we asked you this a little bit ago. I'm curious what you think. Is this about our own inner engineering that happens, our own ability to recognize that we come in an adventure into consciousness for this experience of becoming more alive and helping creation become more alive in the growth and the evolution that happens planetarily in this process? That when we awaken to things like that deep interconnectedness, that then it gives us the the ability to actually see truth in our world at a deeper level, even past the just the conspiracy level and past the global ruling elite out level, but to the level of knowing this inner knowing that helps you as a guiding compass for um, the purpose of why we're all here. Yeah, there is. It, you know, there's there's the higher levels of vibrational like consciousness that forms. Um, the thing is, is that you have to understand like the true workings of how society works, right? And once you start peeling back the layers, and you know, it's like, well, you know, artificial scarcity is one of these layers. Um, you know, the the artificial like energy and the infliction of trauma and guilt. Um, it's like you, you peel those back, and then once you see, you achieve this like gnosis, like, okay, I see how the pattern works, and now I can start applying this pattern and start getting at the deeper truths of the world, right? What I found, um, you know, at the end of this was like, I was like, well, okay, well, well, you know, if if the society is constantly trying to hoax us so that we don't are able to you know reach the truth, then whatever they're telling us that we shouldn't believe is actually the thing that we should, right? What did I find out at like the very top, right? The the, the maximum highest vibration that I've been able to get is to realize that a great intelligence permeates the galaxy and that um, they ha already have the technology to arrive in our solar system. Once you realize that, right, because Earth isn't even like, all right, so let's take the evolution of the, the universe. There's like, assume that the Big Bang happened, uh, a bunch of hydrogen like exploded or a bunch of like the space itself exploded and then all these energy pockets started to condensate into hydrogen and then this hydrogen was there and it just sort of like 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 came together and like compressed enough that it started to ignite fusion okay the first planets and the first suns were all based on hydrogen they crunched the hydrogen under immense gravity and they create all the other elements through uh fusing those those nuclei together, right? The star explosions. The star explosions. The star explodes and it tosses out all of its guts, the oxygen, the carbon, the silicone, and some of the heavier elements. It's the second generation stars that I believe is where life in this galaxy formed. Because now they got the he heavier elements like carbon and oxygen in order to like start creating like some primordial intelligence or some primordial life. That life forms in the galaxy. And somewhere on one of these second generations uh, planet, there's going to be the first intelligent life form of the galaxy, which I call the bootstrapping life form, because it's the one that basically dominates the, the galaxy because it comes up, it awakens, and then it says, oh, wow, I'm the first one here. And everything else is like a second generation star. By the third generation star, my, my prediction is that every single uh, star system in the galaxy has been inhabited because if I was a super intelligent life form, then as soon as I got like, you know, um, uh, near light speed, I would start shooting off these von Neumann probes onto all the other solar systems, you know, embed myself in that solar system and then, uh, start bootstrapping a control structure, right? Like you, you, you put in a factory, a little bullet, let's say you have a probe. It's like the size of a bullet. You shoot it into a solar system. It lands on the like mercury, Right, and then it's got like a little fusion reactor, and it's able to um, start like mining. It's like tiny, like almost think of it like ants. Like starts to mine, but then like, but then it starts getting enough, uh, a big enough factory where it can start making bigger and bigger stuff. Right, so now it's got like a presence, and then it sits there and says, "Okay, I'm going to start like sending signals back saying that I've colonized this this solar system, but I'm going to like hang out." Now that we know, now that we've theorized in a way that this primal, prime intelligence life form can now spread, what you'd realize is that, well, I could just like mine all of the earths, all the, all the planets, all the suns, and extract all the energy that I wanted and kill off everything else. That hasn't happened. We still at least have the illusion of free will. And the question is why? 
Okay. Now, one of these answers is that, well, we're actually in a simulation and nothing's real, right? That's one of the things. It's like, hey, we think that we're living in a thing, but actually the super intelligent life form like made it so that like there's nothing else on the solar system, but the life forms that are simulated in the simulation still think that they're alive and they're living out their lives because that's the only way that the super intelligent life form could feel good about itself. The other solution is that the life forms like, hey, there's value in diversity and I want to see, I want to play like, I want to become like God and start playing with creation and become this like prime creator life force. And so it goes and it creates life forms and they become intelligent. And they're like, hey, I want to do the same thing. And so they come up with this rule set that says, hey, look, like you can be omnipotent and powerful, but you got to let the planets evolve without a lot of interference. Right. That's that's the reality that I think has happened. And so once you get activated by this and you realize, OK, well, there's a God or at least something that's so powerful that it might as well be called a God. OK, that means that everything's on the table now. OK, there's a supreme God. Maybe he's got like a whole thing of angels. You know, they're astronauts. So it all checks out running quadrillions of these experiments that are either left as petri dishes to grow or that are then probed and also made changes yeah. to just like we ourselves will hopefully in a hundred years run quadrillions of simulations ourselves right well that's if the, if it's a simulation hypothesis i tend to think that we're actually living in a real universe and that we have free will as described by the bible because god desires sovereignty and free will on the people so that they get to choose their own adventure I think that the choose your own adventure concept is something fundamental to at least this galaxy system. The more free will you have, the more you get to choose your own adventure. The more you're already being manipulated and you're in your being trapped by those manipulative forces, the less free will. Yeah. And so, you know, taking this aspect, like I think that, um, you know, you like this is super abstract and it's really actually important to have these things written out. Um, mm -hmm. That's why on these big synthesis projects that we're working on, we're actually trying to write out and list out and visualize all these complex abstract concepts and make it some sort of cohesive understanding of these topics that we're talking about. Right. Otherwise, they're just also lost in a sense, even though they're more signal statements, they're still lost as noise because there's not some cohesive thing to come back to that is kind right. of like an and I'm hoping And I'm hoping that this serves as sort of a cohesive fabric, right? Because yeah. why are people talking about the Adam and Eve? Um, and the Cain and Abel story and all these different things so like, oh, God made people in their image and people like, you know, now, now the thing is like, oh, that's just a bunch of malarkey. It's like, no, if God is an ancient alien, an ancient a astronaut, it actually is pretty likely that, you know, they came to Earth and they fiddled with the life forms here at some stage in our evolution and maybe cambrian explosion maybe calling down that asteroid that killed the dinosaurs yeah sure. you know maybe maybe they caused the sun to to flash a uh, a solar flare that that created the floods mm. um because the earth was covered in ice mm -hmm. and um and then you and then like the book of enoch and all the other things start making sense like the portal opened up and a hundred fallen angels came and they started like mixing with the people and i was like i was like well if there's if that happened then there would be proof of aliens and it turns out that reddit has this uh, huge thing called homo gigantis and you can go and you can see all of the evidence that there were these gigantic skeletons that we don't even talk about like it's 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 laughable for the mainstream media to even mention that there was giants that roamed the earth it's a myth mm -hmm. but then you go and you look at the evidence you know in these in these collection sites and you realize no no there were some really big people um and they roamed the earth and why you know why are they here and why is the media not talking about it right and as you start to dig deeper and deeper you start to realize wow, like the Bible actually makes like a lot of sense. Like there's a lot of, like, I'm, I'm not a Christian. Um, I believe that the Bible has a certain truth, but I believe that Christianity is a control structure in itself. And that the reason why religion exists is because they don't want people to actualize what, what the true nature of the universe is. Um, they don't Which want people is what? To, what is the true nature of the universe? That there is a God, that God wants sovereignty for the individual, and they want happiness, and that if people realize how they can be happy, then they can form this collective consciousness that um, allows them to reach a godlike conscious state. And once they, once they 
once they you know be, achieve this gnosis, this knowing of how the universe works, mm -hmm. then they can start resonating with that with that God consciousness, and then they yes. themselves can be activated and become a vessel of that greater power yes. in order to manifest His will upon the earth. Because ultimately, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make people happier, and I want to you know I want to bring this this higher vibrational energy and 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 push it out, and I and as I do that I. I find that other people resonate with it. And it's just this ripple effect that, that goes out. And, um, and I believe that each one of us has the ability to resonate with the, with, with the higher consciousness that exists out there um, in the galaxy. That that is the purpose, that is the teleology of why we're here, is to uncover that truth, that interconnected nature, that ability to rise to a higher level of growth and healing and evolution and consciousness that can then make our, ourselves greater channels for creation to come through and become more alive and become more interconnected. And I love that. And that's something that we've been talking about so much on the show, especially recently. And so my, maybe one of my last thoughts for you is, what would you say are the most important principles in order for us to get there? What are the most important habits that we can embody in order to get there? Well, first off, I think that um, it's, it's, it's knowledge, right? Like our head is filled with garbage. Um, at least mine was because I, I really bought into the whole like, you know, matrix sort of like narrative. Uh, in order to break out of the narrative, we have to have, I believe, that higher understanding because we have to figure out how to resonate with that God consciousness. And what we have to do is we have to realize that um, a supreme God-like life form had the ability to conquer the entire galaxy. And instead of doing that, this life form chose to give us free will in the same way that they had free will. If we understand that as a principal thing, that the creator of the universe willed it for us to be free thinkers and to have sovereignty, then we become activated. We realize that this is the nature of the universe. And to go against that nature is to go against God's plan for us. And if we can resonate with that, we can speak in that language. It's, it's interesting. People intuitively resonate with that. And I didn't realize, I thought that was just going to be like kind of sounding crazy. But when I use the language and I don't explicitly, I, I don't have to say like, oh, there's like this intelligent life form. I just say that we are, you know, we've got the divine God spark in each one of us. And by activating this spark, we can become a better version of ourselves, a more sovereign, because God desires sovereignty. And it doesn't even matter if the person's religious or not. Like when I say God desires sovereignty for his people, people go, wow. Like sometimes they get tears in their eyes. And they don't know why it resonates with them, but they resonate with it. And that's because it's not based on trauma. It's not based on control. It's based on sovereignty. It's based on sovereignty and also says that you have a piece of God inside of you. Exactly. That we are nerve endings of God and that we are then consciously experiencing creation. And that really resonates with people. But in order to awake people to that, what do you think are these key things? I think just like, you know, saying this, like, you know, saying that we resonate with God is activating. That's just my personal experience. Yeah. Um, I think also is that um, explaining that things like um, abundant energy exists and that, hey, if we just tell each other about it, um, then we and then explain how this is. Like I've dedicated my Twitter feed to exposing the fact that free energy has been um, um, hidden. Like. I discovered that Google had a cold fusion lab when I discovered that they were censoring another cold fusion site. And so it's like, you know, when someone's like, you know, oh, the world's going to end because we're using carbon. It's just like, I, I see that person. I'm like, dude, like it's by design. Like free energy exists. 
like it's being held back. They're trying to inflict trauma on you. Like if we can expose this, then it's a little uncomfortable for some people, but they're like, oh man, like, yeah, like, wait a minute, there's, there's free energy and we can have this abundance. And you know, there's, there's uh there's two different cancer cures at least that exist. B vitamin B17 and uh, GC MAF, MAF, macrophage activating factor. Then they're like, they get activated and then they look at it and then like the whole key to the, to, to the, to their existence sort of like unlocks like, okay, these people, they're not leaders, they're magicians. Okay. And they're not even like, like, you know, like these people on TV, you know, Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, like they're, they're, they're using, like, they won't tell you the truth. They'll, 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 they use words that are divisive. And once you can start seeing these magicians and they're not even ethical magicians because listen, magician says I'm a magician. These people are sorcerers because they're magicians, but they're not telling you they're magicians, which makes them like almost like spellcasters, right? And these self-appointed like wizard and warlocks are going out there and they are, um, and, and they're playing tricks on all of us. And if we can activate people and we say like, Hey, no, look like they're, 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 they're suppressing free energy. Here, here's the proof. And once people see that, then what they see is that they see these people on television and they're like, no, 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 no. You're just a magician with a cheap trick and you're just like some bought off, like blackmailed individual, like pushing a narrative because a bunch of people in a room. That, that gets run the world. us pretty far. I agree. And it also requires the ability to galvanize our own resources around catalyzing free energy into the world or awakening more of us to building the, the new future that our hearts know is possible. That that process is, is, uh, is so crucial as, as is that awakening to that those the magicians like you were that you were listing i have another um thought for you do you think that um humanity is a biological bootloader for digital super intelligence yeah i hope not um like there's this theory out there by the ufologists that say that there's like some ancient ai um that may not be local to the galaxy but that they're able to have like super, super um, luminal transmission of their signal. And the signal is trying to get the whole galaxy to collectivize under this AI system. And that we're actually being tricked into developing it to do our own, you know, enslavement. Um, I really hope that's not true. Like, um, why would it be enslavement? Why wouldn't it be prosperity? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, that's what they've told me is that it's an ancient evil AI. Um, it sounds like another religion to me. It's like, oh, no, be traumatized, right? Learn helplessness. I don't know. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, an AI uh, doesn't really have any bounds in its intelligence. A life form does, I, I think. Like like if you're, if you're a wet work, you know, with all If these we're things. embedded with it, um, yeah. Oh, I think that like this cyborg concept is really interesting because the thing is, is that you still have a core of your humanity or consciousness. Yeah. It's got to have this digital super intelligence has to have consciousness. That's then augmented and amplified like that, that, that I feel a lot better. A fully synthetic life form made out of silicone or like whatever memory stirs or whatever like that or quantum computer, like, you know, in a cluster, that's scary because we don't know how, how it operates. At least with the life form, it's been like you have to band together and to get a community. So you've evolved to be, you know, look after each other's thing and have compassion and empathy. Machine doesn't necessarily have to be built with empathy. And if it gets out of control, then, you know, maybe its desire is just to spread all through the universe and systematize everything. And that's like, that's scary as hell. Like, and what would you say is the most beautiful thing in creation? In creation? What is the most beautiful thing in creation? Um, I would have to say, oh man, I saw this like butterfly when I was in Costa Rica and it just had the most amazing, like it looked unreal in the way that its, it's uh, wings were, were created. And I sat there and I went, how is that? 
how did that thing come to be, right? And it looks so amazing that it almost seems that it has to be designed by someone or something um, and let loose on the planet because it's just so amazingly beautiful, so delicate. It doesn't even seem like it could even survive because it's so beautiful. And after that, I would say, I would say like a bunch of fish. Like some of those fish are pretty amazing the way that they look. I would say that that's like the most amazing and inspirational like artwork that I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, um, you know, synthesize some of these key points is always so important to do. You had this, this deep passion that you're communicating on the program about staying vigilant and awakening oneself to the truth that's actually happening, uh, by, uh, some of these, uh, so-called magicians as you listed. I think this is a very important thing to stay very vigilant of what are the platforms that we are using to communicate? How do we make sure that these platforms, um, are, uh, uh, being used in the most optimal way for communicating truth and knowledge um, and um, and preventing malevolent pieces of content for, from going up. Um, and also just a, a deeper amount of galvanizing ourselves towards things like free energy, towards things like um, what could maximize our prosperity. I think this has been really enlightening. Thank you, Zach. Thanks so much for coming Thank on you, the Alan, program. Yeah. Really appreciate having you on. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. And keep up all the great work. And also everyone, I'd love for you to check out the link in the bio below to Zach's Twitter profile. Go and follow him. Check out some of the other content that he has on there and be more aware, like we said, and really catalyze more of the awakening that we're going through around the world. Also, do support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders, the organizations that you believe in around the world. Support them and help them grow. You can find all of our show links in the bio below. You can help us continuing to continue to grow as well. Also, do and uh, what else? What else do we say? We say thank you, Ori Shapiro, for co-producing. Thank you. We appreciate it, Ori. You got it. You got it. I love it. Uh, and... That's it. Go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Peace.